Hey guys, good, good evening everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Please, can you make a reaction so I'll know you all can hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. I'm sorry about Welcome. So let's give three more minutes for others to join. So we'll start off by 5.05, .05, so at least more people can join.
Okay, guys. So it's five o six. Yeah, let's just start. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I believe our day went well. And yeah. Okay, so first off, we will start this session with an opening speech or remark by Dr. Namde Obase, and he's here in our midst. So I'll share my screen. So I'll read out his profile. So we know who will be, who will be talking to us this evening. So hold on while I share my screen. Okay, hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, it seems we've lost comfort. Um, my name is Amara Chike, and I am your co-host for this evening. So I will be reading Dr. Nan Namdi's um, profile. Namdi is an exceptionally talented and self-motivated doctor with a wide array of interests ranging from neuroscience, business analysis, finance, mental health, health advocacy, breast cancer awareness to public health and philanthropy. A swift learner who can take in new ideas and communicate effectively both as an individual and in a team, Namdi is a highly innovative mind who has a strong passion to change the world through innovative products and services. Namdi over the years has been a part of several research and humanitarian organizations. His drive to give back led him to co-found an NGO, Johan Africa, which aims to promote health and healthy living in Africa through health education, advocacy, and low-cost intervention programs. He is also the initiator of Safe Space Nigeria and Save the Breast campaign programs, which are projects helping to increase awareness of mental health issues and reduce late presentation of breast cancer patients to hospitals, respectively. He believes solutions to humanity's biggest challenges lie in technology and research. 
with his talents and passion. He is doing his part to find these solutions. So please, um, let's welcome. The Um, hello, guys. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Um, I'm really sorry. Can, I don't know if my camera is on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> great, it's on. Sorry, um, I'm having some internet issues. I um, was a bit unsure. Um, good evening, everyone. Nice to meet you guys. Um, uh, I'm actually very, very excited to be on this today. Uh, been looking forward to this, and I'm glad it finally came. Um, it's finally here. And um, so I'd like to um, welcome you guys to this year's Johan Summit to the title um, "Ignite Young Minds, Bold Solutions, um, and Transforming Africa's Healthcare." And I'll just go straight to the point. Uh, hope you guys can hear me. Can you hear me? Um, yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so straight to the point. It's no um it's no it's no news that Africa's healthcare indices are poor. Uh, for example, one in every ten young child dies before his or her fifth birthday. Uh, our maternal and, and, and mortality, um our maternal mortality ratio is still one of the highest in the world, if not the highest. 814 per 100,000 women die annually. And the funny thing is that these are all preventable deaths. Uh, but it's not all that bleak. There's been some progress made in the past couple of years. Uh, however, the gap is still widening. And it's obvious we're not doing something right. So something is wrong as public health physicians and as academics um, in sub Saharan Africa and indeed the global south. We're missing something. And I put this blame largely on the government. There is a glaring lack of political will and subsequent underinvestment in healthcare by the government. Um, and I don't think this will change anytime soon. And this is why we should have our destinies in our hands as you know, average Nigerians and average Africans. Um, Africa is actually quite unique in that we don't have the complicated or the complex diseases of the Western world, you know, the terrible genetic, um, you know, imbalances, metabolic syndromes and the likes. Largely what we suffer here is basically um, tropical, you know, infectious diseases, which are largely containable. And even the non-communicable diseases, the so-called non-communicable non -communicable diseases are still very manageable. Hypertension, diabetes, which are the most prevalent diseases down here, is still very much manageable. But why do we have so much people dying? Why are our, why is, for instance, in Nigeria, our life expectancy just 54 years? You know, so these are questions we should be asking ourselves, and these are questions we've been asking ourselves as young minds for some time now. And if you take a closer look at it, you'd see that um, our poor healthcare system, um, you know, is is will I say vestige vestige of um, our past colonial history. You know, so because if you look at other um, institutions spread across, not just Nigeria in Africa. You look at education, you look at security, you look at judiciary, you look at science and technology in general. We have failed to evolve past the knowledge we had 50, 60 years ago. Um, we're still, you know, struggling to do the basics, you know, 
in Nigeria, for instance, we are very, the, the academics in particular are very um, interested in prevalence, are very interested in quantity. How do you quantify the burden of this disease, the volume of this disease, how many people are, are affected? But there I say that we, we are intellectually lazy because we've not decided to go the step further in asking why are these diseases happening? For instance, why are there more people coming down with um, chronic kidney disease, with stroke, you know, among young people in particular? Why is there any, a higher incidence of breast cancer among young girls in Nigeria? You know, and like I said, it's, well, I say it's the intellectual laziness, which you can mirror in basically all the, you know, most of the institutions spread across Nigeria. We are comfortable with the status quo, you know, and we academics are largely to be blamed as well. Um, so I, I recently read an article on the Lancet recently with the title, uh, Will Global Health Survive Its Recolonization? And here um, they were trying to, the authors were trying to envision um, um, an equitable global healthcare model where nations were deemed equal in their in their contributions and access to global health and public health in particular. And a friend of mine chimed in, you know, he made a spin-off remark. He was like, imagine a scenario where um, for example, the University of Nigeria carried out a research on homelessness in say San Francisco, because of course it's an epidemic over there. You know, imagine the University of Lagos carrying out a research on on uh, you know these opioid crisis, for instance, in the US, and then preferring solutions to them. Uh, I couldn't imagine that for obvious reasons. I mean, we've not even solved our problems, not talk less of you know, going that far. But I really didn't need to imagine it, because why do we need to go there where the University of Nigeria could study, like I said, the rising cases of stroke and chronic kidney diseases? I mean, we in the clinic see these things every day. For instance, in my first my first um, um, clinical rotation as, as a doctor, my first um, uh, my first call at night, we admitted, I think it was eight stroke patients that night, cerebral vascular disease, um, accidents, CVA patients that night. And <laughs> unfortunately, out of that number, 80 to 90 percent either died the next day or died um, you know, a few weeks later. And I was puzzled. I mean, I, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was really that bad. You know, why aren't we studying why these things are happening and why these diseases, for instance, are more um, invasive in, in, in our cultures, in our environments? You know, so, yeah. And beyond asking why, can't we start thinking of solutions to actually solve these problems, locally grown, indigenous, ingenious solutions to solve these problems? Yeah, so um, this is why Johan was, was thought of in a, in a nutshell, because I think a lot of us, a lot of us youths would agree that the, our foreigners have not helped us a lot, and they are not looking like they're going to do so much more because Quite frankly, a lot of them are giving up. And so it behoves on us to take up this mantle and actually, like I said, carve our own destiny. And again, this is why Johan was born. And the whole idea of Johan, the whole goal of Johan is to effectively involve the African youth in creatively advancing comprehensive community health um, access across um, continents. And we hope to do this through research, health education, and cost-effective uh, targeted in, um, interventions, advocacy, and networking. Um, our strategy over the years has been to connect um, a network of young minds like ours to relevant resources with, through which they can do more, improve themselves, and then offer more to the society. You know, to engage young minds through trainings like we're doing today, conferences, and like we've done over 20 times in the past four years. And let's expose them to uh, field experiences through our various outreaches and finally commissioning them to be agents of this new health revolution in Africa. And so um, in conclusion, I'm extremely proud of the executive director, um, Dr. Zubich Program, but the entire uh, team of directors and the entire 
um, Johan Tim, our incredible volunteers who have worked tirelessly through the past years to at least start something. You know, the, the challenge is actually in starting, right? Um, we shouldn't be comfortable with where we are as youths. We can do more. And for instance, why would, for instance, the University of California look down to us when we don't have evidence of things we've done? Why would they cut funding, for instance? And in fact, why do we even need their funding if we can't show efforts, you know, you know, to solve our own little problems? So yes, we have to start something. And this is why um, we are holding this kind of conventions. And I'm happy that you've, you've tried to join us and try to, you know, get a hang of what's going on. And so, what started as a dream in your hand over four years ago has blossomed to a global, um, you know, you know, organization in with footholds in six African countries and counting. And there I say this is the kind of infection we need. Uh, not microbes spread by mosquitoes or bats, <laughs> but life-changing public health knowledge and better ways of doing things, uh, this time spread by young minds like us. So with these last words, I welcome you all to this summit and enjoy it to listen keenly and catch the packaging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for those um, opening remarks. Now we'll move on to questions. Do anyone, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Namdi? Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the schedule. So our next our next speaker is Olutola Awosiko. Um come first. Yeah, All right, thank, thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, Olutola Awosiko. Olutola Vivian Awosiko is a digital health advocate with an academic background in biomedical laboratory science. She's particularly focused on working at the intersection of healthcare data, innovation, and entrepreneurship. She is the director of operations at Digital Health Africa, a youth led NGO on a mission to promote digital health agenda in Africa through improving access to health information and promoting community engagement among stakeholders in the digital health ecosystem. The NGO recently launched the largest community of students innovating in the healthcare space as a way of increasing youth participation in digital health. Olutola currently works as a programs manager at Zuri Health, a leading telehealth organization in Africa. Please let's welcome Olutola. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Please, can you confirm if you can hear me? We can hear you. Good evening. We can hear you. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and um, good evening, everyone. My name is Awushi Kolutola Vivian. 
um, I'm a digital health advocate and I also uh, I'm the founder of Digital Health Africa and I work as the programs assistant programs manager at Zuri Health where I develop preventive uh, care programs for underserved population in Africa. Let me just share my screen. Please confirm that you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, awesome. So today I've been given the task to talk on uh, a topic that I'm really passionate about, which is how do we hack healthcare in Africa, leveraging technology, design thinking, and you know, grassroots initiatives. So, um, okay, let me make this a slideshow. Awesome. All right, and I'll be following this content, um, which is essentially to give us an idea, to paint a picture of the state of healthcare in Africa. What does hacking mean? Then we'll start taking each of these um, hacking strategies one after the other after which we would take um, question and answer. All right. So let me start by talking about the state of healthcare in Africa. I'm, I'm very sure this is, <laughs> we are all on the continent. We all know what has been happening. I think right from uh, childhood, I don't think I've experienced a better healthcare since I've been born up till now. In, in, I'm from Nigeria in Nigeria. And now I'm in Kenya, and it's you know you can see that the Kenya doctors are now in the fifth week of their strike since March. So I don't think I need to explain to anybody how uh, the state of our healthcare system is at the moment, because we have one of the worst healthcare system in the world, right? And as you can see on the slide, I stated that Africa is a region of the world where health issues are the most critical, and half of the 57 countries in the world suffering from you know, critical shortage of health personnel as defined by WHO. We're actually on the we're at 36, right? On that 36 of that countries are actually in Africa. So it's a, it's a really bad state. It's a really, really bad state. And you know, less than one doctor, like one doctor uh, attend to 1,000 people, right? daily in most of our healthcare facilities across the continent. And we have shortage of healthcare personnel. Um, I don't think I need, I need to explain too much on how, you know, even in Nigeria, the Japa syndrome is really affecting our healthcare system, right? We could see that a lot of healthcare personnel are moving out of the country, right? At least 5,000 people leave Nigeria every month for, you know, various, Various reasons. One, which is the you know brain drain, and aside from that, the dilapidated healthcare system has, has also facilitated medical tourism. You know, lots of people leave the country every month for various form of treatment abroad, and this not only affects you know the state of um, health of people generally, it also affects our uh, economy because due to medical tourism, we lost we every I think about 1.2 billion US dollars lost from Nigeria economy to medical tourism yearly, right? And we are faced with a lot of financial barriers to healthcare services, high rate of out-of-pocket expenditure because we don't have an effective national health insurance system. We have a poor service integration. As I've said, human resources is, I am, is, very, uh, is very low, right? And you know, this affects the progress or the, how would I would like call it, the progress of our healthcare system, you know, towards achieving universal health coverage, right? And according to WHO, right, there are like seven building blocks of like a, of an enabling healthcare system, right? Service delivery, healthcare workforce, healthcare information system, medicine and technology, financing, leadership and governance. Majority of African countries are 
unable to meet this basic requirement for a good healthcare system, right? So I don't know if I'm if I've been able to paint a picture using different you know unit analysis, the uh, brain drain, economies, and you know other factors that have actually re reflected the poor state of our healthcare system in Africa. But um, you know, with the start of this year, and you know, recently, as well as due to the COVID pandemic, we've seen a lot of breakthrough, and it's looking like there's a beacon of hope somewhere around the corner, due to you know, digital technology, right? So I believe the healthcare landscape in Africa is poised for positive transformation. Despite the challenges faced in recent years, I believe that we can make significant progress, right? and you know and boost our healthcare system all right so uh, moving forward so this is just i think i mentioned the uh africa has the highest disease body as you can see from this chart the communicable disease um ncd cancer you could see that we have against other our continent europe we have the highest uh, rate of this disease, as well as our life expectancy. The 10 lowest countries with the um, lowest life expectancy are actually African countries, right? So this is just to let you see some indicators of how our healthcare system is being reflected across board. So now, when you say hacking, I know when you say the word hacking, this is this is something that kind of pops up in everybody's head. You think of one guy sitting somewhere, you know, writing numerous codes. I think watching all these sci-fi movies have actually like um give us a bias towards what we think hacking is, which honestly is not wrong, right? So I could bet that when you hear the word hacking, I could bet that majority of us would think this kind of picture will come to our mind right hundreds of codes be written you're hacking through a system and all of those things i know some of us aspire to do all of these things when we're growing up based on the kind of movies and stuff we we're watching but that's not all or that i, I won't say that's not the entirety of what hacking means so when you go to the root word of of hacking it's, it's an old english root word which means to cut into pieces so in the context of what we're discussing today, it means um, hacking is associated with finding innovative solutions by making improvements or bypassing limitations in a system or process, right? So it essentially means like going the unconventional way, going the unconventional way, right? So it means you are trying to be creative, you are trying to be resourceful to address a particular challenge, which in this context within the healthcare system through unconventional means, right? Because I believe that with the current state that we are in Africa with the picture and all the startup I've stated earlier, traditional approaches might not cut it anymore. You might have to infuse a bit of innovation, right? Um, to address the root cause of these issues, which highlight the need for us to hack. And here it means fresh perspective. What unconventional means can we use to bypass the limitations in our healthcare system, right? So yes, I just defined it here that when you say hacking in healthcare, it refers to the process of creatively and resourcefully addressing challenges within the healthcare system through unconventional means. And some of the unconventional means I'm going to state are one, you know, design thinking, using technology, and you know, grassroots initiatives. But so what's the benefit um, for hacking in the healthcare system? Looking at the current state that we are all aware about, and some of us are also participants in this, you know, in these challenges. We work in the healthcare system. You are a patient, you are a client, you are a user of um you you you, you, um, you also need healthcare services and all. So we all understand um the challenges that have been faced in our healthcare system currently. So what is the benefit of us adopting an all conventional approach, innovation. One is that it reduces inefficiency in delivering of our healthcare services. Healthcare experience in Africa is not a joyful one. It's like when you even go to the hospital, you are more sad than you came, honestly. Especially when you go to places like UCH in Ibadan, 
<laughs> you feel more stressed if you are someone that like maybe your your fever level was not by the time you leave this age you would almost not collapse because the processes are so inefficient you kill from one point to another there's sometimes they say there's no light you have to wait for the light to come up so that you can run um you can run your test or sometimes they will say there's no uh medication that part, the particular medication you want to get in the pharmacy they don't have it so you have to go outside to get it right so a lot of inefficiencies redundant processes repetitions of stuff you come here you fill the form you go to the next place you fill the same form and you know it's just i pity patient relative honestly because it's not easy to care for someone within a nigerian healthcare hospital or something because at the end of the day by by the time you are done caring for that person and running around you yourself need to take your own parastamol so that you can be fine <laughs> right because the processes are really inefficient so one of the benefits of hacking in healthcare is so that we can reduce this, or we can reduce these bottlenecks, right, and take away the pain um, from accessing healthcare services. And I, I believe one of the reasons why people don't really go to the hospital until they're like almost dying is because of these processes. Because it's really difficult. It's really difficult. It's really stressful, right? And it's just a sad experience. So most times you are not really interested to go in to go to the clinic until like maybe your heart is already shifting from one side to another. I'm just exaggerating anyway. But until it's really an emergency, you won't want to go because it's not something you look forward to. The experiences are not joyful. Yeah, so that's one of the benefits to remove all these bottlenecks and you know, pain point. Um other benefits include personalizing care to uniqueness of patients and service users so that you know the specific treatment you are getting is personalized to you uh, according to your maybe your your genetics, um, your behavior, your behavior, uh, your behavior, and also you know, just personalized to your person and not a general treatment, especially people living with not um, chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension who needs, uh, they need to follow a particular diet, follow a particular medication and all. So, but you know, when you go to our clinics and they, they just give you, okay, go and use on, go and use on. The, the, the time they even spend with patients is really, really short because they have lots of people on the queue, right? So there is no personalized care for our patients within our current healthcare system. Improving the quality of care, reducing cost of services, as I've said, you spend a lot because once the processes are inefficient, then you also you have to spend a lot because at every point there is a cost that will be um, aggregated at the end of the day. You go to this clinic, you fill a form, you open a card, they will tell you, oh, we don't have a uh, the specialist, then you go to, they will refer you to another place, and you pay again, you pay for to open another file, you pay like a lot of things. So it's it's really costly for patients, especially for us. In Africa, where we spend 70% 70, 70 of the population spend out, out of their pocket money, there's no insurance, there's no effective insurance uh, scheme. So these are the benefits of you know, infusing innovation and hacking in the healthcare system. It takes away all of this, uh, some of the challenges I've mentioned. Um, so moving forward, so one of the catalysts or one of the ways that we can hack in the healthcare system in Africa is leveraging design thinking is leveraging um, design thinking in healthcare. And please let me know if I'm still audible. Am I still audible? All right, awesome. So leveraging design thinking in healthcare. So if you're someone who, are, who is interested in innovating in the healthcare system, um design thinking methodology i think is one of the approach that is really important for you to understand right i believe no healthcare innovation should be done without design thinking without leveraging the design thinking methodology right so what is design thinking so i'll just paint a scenario so for example we are trying to so there is this particular um community where people have to maybe take like about two hours three hours before they can get access to clean water right so that's like so let's let's hack this together that's the that's the problem before us it takes them about two to three hours before they can get to where um a clean water is or a resource so the parents send their children to go get clean water and you know it takes them a lot of time before they get to where a clean water is so in your mind 
if you want to solve this problem, what are you going to be thinking about? I can't see the chat session, so I'll just uh, assume you start typing in what your what you think your solution would be to this problem. I just how do you bring how do you bring clean water closer to this community, right? So in our head now, you know, we think we all have an idea, or we all we all have a solution to this problem, right? So um, you think that that particular solution you have in your in your head is actually the right solution for the community, right? So in your head, you've assumed that, okay, this is it. But by the time you go to the community and you tell them that this is your solution, you now realize that it was, there's a mismatch, right? It's not actually solving what they want. So you're like, oh, okay. So I thought, you know, this is going to work, but alas, it's not going to work because that's not the solution they, they actually need. Right. So design thinking, so let me just move this forward. Right. So design thinking is working together through a user-centered approach to come up with um, a feasible solution. Right. So at the end of the day, we all agree, all the stakeholders involved, both you always developing, always hacking the, the um, person who is going to use it. And every other stakeholder agrees that, okay, this is a very useful solution that's going to solve this particular problem, right? So the answer, so that scenario I, 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 I just painted. So for us, what we did was to come up with, oh, you know, let's just dig a ball hole, you know, very close to them. Like that's like the, that's like the most reasonable solution, right? For us to come up with, let's just, you know, have a clean water, you know, system that can bring clean water closer to them, dig, just dig a ball hole and, you know, Let's just bring this clean water closer to them. So we thought of, you know, digging boreholes and all of those things. Do you know what the problem was? <laughs> Actually, the real problem, the real problem was not the distance. The real problem was the fact that the parents of these children want to have a private time with themselves. So they send their children far away to go and get water, right? Because that's the only time they can, they have to have a private time with themselves. So how did you, how can you solve that? But well, we, we've gone ahead to go and dig ball hole. So you can see there's a mismatch already. You dig the ball hole, they will pass by it and still go three hours away to go and get the water because that's not their problem. The problem was not <laughs> actually the water in the first place. The problem was actually the fact that they just want a free time. They want a private time with themselves. So they send their children far away to go and get water, right? So this is how you don't just assume solutions to things and you just, just pump money into it, assuming that this solution is going to work. That's not how you hack in the healthcare system, especially in this Africa where we don't even have enough resources to try too many things, right? You don't have the resources to try too many things, to throw money and do pilot, pilot, pilot. And there's something called pilotitis, which is the art of people just doing pilot, pilot and abandoning all these projects, especially in healthcare. Right, you can you can Google pilotitis and you know read more about it. So what you want to do is to use a design thinking approach, so that one, your solution is viable; two, it is feasible; three, it is sustainable. So these are the three things you are looking at when you want to hack in the healthcare system. We are coming up with ideas or solutions to particular challenges. So you have to follow a process to ensure that the human, the end user, is at the middle of everything you are doing, everything you are thinking about. Right, so it helps you to optimize, optimize for that particular challenge. So, and when you are having a design thinking mindset, it's not a straightforward process, right? It's zigzag, zigzag. Like, don't think that oh, you are going to, you are going to identify a challenge today, and you know, by the time you follow one to three steps, you get your solution, and that is the end. No, it doesn't work that way. When you are, when you are um, going through a design thinking process. It's not a straightforward, it's not linear. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You keep ideating, you keep improving your solution, even after it has been implemented or deployed, right? So as I've said, design thinking does not start with users because already when you say users, you've already sterile, you've already um, limited the scope of that solution to a particular set of people or something. When you're starting, start with people, right? An individual, a person, human being. 
right? So you re because you start with user, client, customer, stakeholder, like you've tagged them already. You've given them a tag already. And in your mind, and as you think about it, you will be only be limited to that tag that you've given those people. But when you start with people, okay, as a human being, what are their needs, right? Before you now start, you know, before you at the end of the day, carve them into a particular target user or target audience um, framework. So when you are uh, design thinking in healthcare, there are processes, there are flows to design thinking. You don't just start anywhere. The first thing is you start with empathy, then you define your problem, then you ideate on the on the solution you're trying to you know come up with, then you create a prototype, then you test. Um, okay, I think I'll just rush through this process. So the first thing is empathize, understand the needs, the desires and pain points of all stakeholders involved, not just the patients at this point, because healthcare is a very complex and complicated system. There are too many stakeholders involved, though it has to be patient-centric because these are, at the end of the day, they are the beneficiaries. But remember that they don't work, patients don't work alone. They are healthcare providers, they are caregivers, they are administrators also. So you have to put that into perspective, understand their needs, understand their desires, understand their pain points. And you can do this through, you know, go out there. Don't just sit in your room or sit in, the, in your hostel or campus or something and start coming up with pitch deck, very beautiful pitch deck of this idea, that idea. Honestly, when you get to the field, it will flop. It is going to flop, right? Because you've not put the pain points, the desires and the needs of these people into perspective. You are only assuming, and you can do all the research, you can you can do all the research you, you want online, get all the papers and all, it still cannot give you the actual picture of what these people are going through. You need to go out there, do the dirty work, talk to them, talk to them, talk to the actual people that, are, that you want to create uh, or that you want to solve for or whatever. You can do interviews, observations, surveys to gather insights, focus group, ask them questions. And when you're asking questions, don't ask uh, questions like, do you need a phone? Of course, they'll tell you that I need a phone, right? Don't ask, um, or like ask open-ended question, like why, what, how. Those are, the, those are the kind of question you're supposed to ask so that it helps them explain what they're actually going through, not just, um, yes, yes or no, you know, questions and don't lead them on, right? Don't lead them on because you, you are trying to ensure that they say that they want your solution. So you start leading them. Oh, do you have this app? Oh, do you, you start leading them so that at the end of the day, oh, okay, I interviewed 100 people, out of 100, 90 say they need my app. How? How did you arrive at that? What was your um, interview strategy, question, stra questioning strategy? Did you, did you use to arrive to that uh, conclusion? Don't give them leading questions, right? Just be as flexible and open as possible because sometimes what you think will be the solution is through the conversations that you have with them that will give you an entire new perspective on how to approach it, right? So I think it's very important to understand it so that you don't start creating solution for a problem that doesn't exist in the first place. Then after you've gathered all this insight, you've um, you've come up with um, how I call it. You've come up with the insight from your surveys and interviews and all. You can then define the problem. Do you see that you didn't define the problem from the beginning? Because that's where most of us miss it. We already defined the problem. Um, not communicable disease. Less than fifty-seven percent of Kenyans are battling with. Uh, cardiovascular disease, blah, 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 blah. You put a very nice pitch there, put the problem, blah, 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 you put it there. But you've missed the first step. The first step is actually to talk to the people, ask them the questions you need to ask them. Then you define the problem. Based on the insight you get from the conversations, you can then define the problem that, oh, um, the people, let me say, for example, people in, Mas uh, in Masabis County in Kenya, the farmers, you know, they go through, the weather is very harsh for them, blah, blah, blah. So they suffer from malnutrition. But you know, now you can define the problem based on the insight you've gotten, right? So that's like the, the problem um, definition. That's defined, that's a defined stage. Then you ideate. So you go through brainstorming sessions. I think for brainstorming sessions, you'll be able to come up with at least 
50 to 60 ideas. Come up with as, as much ideas as possible. So your team should brainstorm. Okay, how can we approach this? How can we, how can we approach? Okay, this is the problem of identifying why. Ask yourself why like five times so you can get to the root cause of that problem, right? Then you can start creating solutions, come up with different ideas, right? It's not just that first idea that comes to your mind. That should be the final idea. Still think for that. You know, do brainstorming, wide range of possible solutions to that defined problem. As much as 60, 50 ideas can be generated, honestly, in a brainstorming session, right? So it, does, it doesn't have to be just one, that your one idea that is not in the dream. You're like, this is it. I cannot let go of this particular solution. Be very open-minded. That's why the last slide was showing that zigzag. Because when you're going to design think it's not, as I said, it's not linear. It's zigzag. Um, so you ideate, you ideate, you can use mind mapping, you can use different tools to do your, you know, to, to structure your ideation. You can use sticky notes, mind mapping tools, rapid prototyping tools to explore, okay, to explore all the solutions you've identified. You can quickly explore them and refine, then you can trickle down to maybe one or two, right? Then you prototype and test. Right, so it could be a physical, if it's a physical product, you can do maybe a little MVP or something, pilot it, let people let people use it. The people you've interviewed, go back to them. Okay, based on what we discussed, you said this is your problem, okay. And you know, we both talked and we found out that this is how it can be solved. Can you test, can you use this app for six, for maybe two months, right? And let's see if this actually solves your problem. Right, so you go back and do a pilot study, usability test, simulations. It doesn't have to be something big. Don't go and um, maybe AI or whatever. No, not yet. You can use it. You can just do a low fidelity prototype, right, and let them use it. MVP, just push it out there. Let them test alpha testing, beta testing. Let them test, and once you are done, you can evaluate the effectiveness of that solution. Is it does it really solve? Like at the barest minimum, does it solve one, maybe one quarter of this person's uh, this person's problem, right? Then based on the feedback from that testing, you you go back and iterate. So you keep iterating, iterating. Once uh, you've gotten enough feedback and you, you are ready to push to market, then you push and implement. Then you can start thinking of how to scale it um, to a general, to a wider audience. So these are the benefits of, you know, or these are the processes or questions you need to ask during design thinking in healthcare. What do your patients need? Um, how easy is it to do business with them, especially if you are doing B2B? Um, for the physicians, administrators, like, you know, you can go through this cycle of questions. What is their experience? How will they interact with your solution? And all, and all, and all. So design thinking is human-centered, as I've said, human-centered, it's a creative, um, it's a creative methodology because you need to generate a lot of creative ideas. You have to prototype. Then it's also hypothesis based because you are experimenting and testing your solution until it fits, until you have that um, product market fit or user product fit, right? Okay. And for you to hack properly using design thinking, you need uh, support from different, especially in the healthcare system, you need support from different stakeholders across because healthcare as i've said is complicated it's complex and it's fragmented because there are different stakeholders so you have to get buy-in from both the ones that are the business side of it the leaders the healthcare providers and you who is the tech person coming in and um other partners you might come up with so why should you use design thinking it helps you to understand your met needs of your users it helps you to generate new insights it helps you to get buy-in you learn faster and feel cheap instead of dumping millions of dollars to create one gigantic project and at the end of the day it flops because people are not that's not what they need honestly you've gone to create one ai blockchain you know all those big big names you've done everything and you're like ah, i can't read though sorry you're like jesus you can't read because you've not factored the literacy level of literacy into your users right have you had have you talked of uh their language barriers and all have you added english yoruba swahili or something because you've gone ahead to just do your thing right at the end of the day you fail and it will be very expensive so it's better to fail cheaply when you've done your little even if it's just sms that is 
honestly, it's just SMS because there are stacks, there are technology stacks, you know, USSD, SMS, then the mobile, uh, the mobile part, then before you start going to AI and all of those things. So can you start with the lower stack and test on that so that you can, you know, it's very cheap. It's cheaper to feel that way than when you dumped in a lot of money and at the end of the day, nobody's using it. It also reduces innovation risk. So as you can see, Ketchup, they went through different, <laughs> different phase of their, you know, products, their products, you know, they, 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 they made the product stand up, right? But at the end of the day, the users use it, you know, by turning the Ketchup down, right? So you, as you can see, um, that's the essence of design thinking. So now, why I added grassroots initiatives they are not tech is because I also believe there are levels, there are levels um, to the way we approach things. Um, when you use design thinking, as I've said, the human component is the major component, right? Now, grassroots initiatives is also um, a major component when you're hacking because, as I've said, our mobile internet penetration is still very low. Do we? I think like 65% or something in Africa. So people are still, we still have a lot of people who are still not online right so if you are trying to you know if you go from design thinking to tech i think you are going to widen the digital divide right that's why i didn't go to tech my 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 topic was tech design thinking and grass initiative but i think that's not the right way to have put it should, it should be design thinking grass initiative and tech if you are trying to look at um following that approach in hacking in healthcare so i think grassroots initiative is one major key component of how we can scale uh innovations in healthcare in africa you can make all the applications you, you have in your head the hair and whatever but you see these people at the bottom of the pyramid oh lord they are the ones that are actually meant to be targeted most times right because number one there's poverty they don't have they have lack of access to financial uh uh finance to get you know quality health care services or like in the urban area they don't have actually they don't have literacy they don't have health literacy or like people in the urban area right then there's geographical barriers as well or like the people in the uh urban area i think according to research you should be two hours away from an hospital that's the standard international standard everybody should live two hours away from a clinic but of course <laughs> in africa it's not like that right it's not like that so grassroots initiate um, innovation is really important because you have to find practical and creative solutions to use your indigenous knowledge to solve localized problems because i believe this is how we are going to scale Ethical innovation in Africa, if at all, uh, are going to be doing that, uh, which I believe most of us are really interested in. So for for um grassroots initiative, I believe um they are like the critical link for grassroots initiatives or organizations who are already doing this, they're like a critical link between communities and the primary healthcare system in Africa. And we have like over one million community health workers across SSA alone, right? And these people are constantly working to reduce the barriers to healthcare, providing low cost healthcare solutions and you know, creating public health awareness to their community, right? So I think it's really important if you want to act, um, try to understand how the grassroots um, innovation works. You can do innovation around community health education, raising awareness on health issues, preventive measures. I think in Kenya, um, I think five out of people that have uh, hypertension in Kenya, I think maybe five out of 15 actually are aware that they have high blood pressure. There's no awareness because there's no screening in the first place. So they are not, they don't know. In fact, there was a camp we did last last week. Um, somebody with diabetes had, I, can't, I don't know the actual, uh, data now but it was so high i'm like how did this person get here in the first place how did you walk to this place people are not aware of these things they don't know about their health care status and all. it's not honestly it's not their fault. there is a low uh health education amongst africans generally so you can in innovate around that everything is not ai everything is not blockchain or whatever whatever you can innovate around these things how to raise awareness about health issues can be through workshops, campaigns, all of those things about their nutrition, hygiene, health advocacy, community health promotion, capacity building and empowerment. I have to also work closely with the community health workers and their local 
grassroots um, governments because they listen more to people they know already. So even you as an innovator, even if you are bringing AI, um, sorry, I'm not against AI, even if you are bringing AI or whatever, you have, to, you have to work closely with their primary healthcare uh, workers, community healthcare workers, um, so that they can help you interpret all these things, their own local terms, help them understand it. Once they are, they are familiar with their own people, right? So there's a trust already that is already being built, right? So grassroots initiative is really important. And some of the examples is, um one is this Lucy, Lucy app. So it's, it's, it was developed by Amref, Amref Health. You can check them online. So Amref, there's Amref International University, there's Amref Netherlands, and also they, they worked on a project called the Kelezi uh, project, right? Which means to implement. So one of the one of the products they, they came up with is this Lucy app, which was which, which is for pregnancy for um to help mothers who are pregnant to understand their pregnancy progression labor delivery procedures postnatal care and you know whatever so they deployed this at the community health level and what they did is that they empowered community health promoters to refer clients you know to this app and to enroll them right they were, i think they were able to even develop a portable ultrasound um ultrasound machine or something like that so it's 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 something that is is possible right so you can you can bring in both design thinking and grassroots uh, innovation you know link them together and you know i believe it can enhance the lives of people in resource constraint settings then i think the next um uh, is mom connect uh, mom connect is in south africa right it also help um people um uh, mothers who are pregnant postnatal as well I think they, they connect basically on WhatsApp, honestly. I don't think there is any sophisticated tech to mom connect, if I'm right. Just WhatsApp um, consultations with doctors to support them on their pregnancy journey, give them um, uh, meal plans, you know, and every other thing they need to know. So then IntelliSoft, IntelliSoft is an health IT system um, startup, not, not a startup, like a company in Kenya as well. And what they did as well is to create a, is to create, I think, this community health toolkit, which is digital, right? Then they linked it to a maternal health information system that can be used in low resource healthcare facilities. And it's been, it's currently being used in Kenya. Yes, I so you can watch their video and actually see how this uh solution is actually impacting lives at the grassroots level. At the grassroots level. So if you are thinking of high falutin solutions, it might not be necessary, you can do some of the solutions that you know um that have low tech stack and can be still be useful at the grassroots level then now i notice what um most of you always like the technology part let's go to tech let's go to ai part all right so we are here now um so for the technology part as you all know there are different ways to use tech in the healthcare system there are different applications telehealth um supply chain logistics electronic medical records analytics, emergency response, personal healthcare records, pharmacy, online pharmacy and all. And this is, this is the snapshot of the startup that are already innovating in all of these numerous um, applications in Africa, right? So I don't know if I should, I can't go through everything. It's a lot, and this is just, this is not everything, honestly. There are so many other startups Right. So I'll just pick it. Maybe I'll just talk on each of these things one by one. For electronic medical records, of course, um, it's really essential in our healthcare system. As I've mentioned, there are a lot of inefficiencies. So coming up with an, a connected electronic medical record, not just a standalone one, you have one electronic medical record startup uh, or application being used in hospital A. They went go to hospital B. There is another one, and st honestly, it still keep increasing that fragmentation at the end of the day. I think what, what we need is a national electronic medical record. That's one that every the whole country can use. Ghana has done that and they are doing really well. They have a national electronic electronic medical record system. Can, um, Senegal just launched theirs yesterday, right? Um, so I think it, 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 it's going to be very useful because then you just need your maybe a national ID number or your health card that you can just use and wherever hospital you go to, your data is readily available the exchange of data is much efficient that way so hospitals can talk to one another right 
use is useful for research is useful for even medical practitioners because by the time you infuse ai into the electric, electronic medical record it makes it much more an intelligent system because then when you use ai into the system it helps the doctor with clinical decision support now by the time they type parastamol before they finish typing parastamol ai has completed it for them so now they have more time to attend to patients right because an average doctor in nigeria spends more time documenting writing than even listening to the patients or understanding what they're going through right so it can take away all these inefficiencies then it can recommend based on your data the ai can recommend stuff like drugs to test or whatever it is you can use your drug to drug interaction to be there then you know it kind of just shortens that turnaround time that they would have rather have spent documenting and writing and writing and writing right and also it helps them diagnose faster because now the ai has been trained with a lot of data sets around you know clinical diagnosis and all so once it imputes some symptoms it can already tell what the diagnosis can be and start you know informing the doctor right so it can you know it makes that consultation much faster then your document your data is all in one place you can also access it via your patient portal and all of those things so the electronic medical record is really going to be a fantastic idea um so that's technology that can be used to hack in the healthcare system telehealth of course um basically talking to your doctor over the phone via video conferencing or maybe now whatsapp is even the <laughs> it's like the most accessible form of telehealth honestly it's very fast just clicking just typing um most of this okay for zuri health we have a chat bot that has been integrated into whatsapp so you just chat and it, you get instant response and you're connected to a doctor at the speed of light doctor asks you you know certain questions and all refers you to okay buy this drug or buy it. and in less than 10 minutes you are done and if there is any need for you to come do maybe imaging or check up on you know, they can book such appointment and you know so it's much easier that way so that's telehealth is basically having a consultation with your doctor over the phone without necessarily leaving the comfort of your home so we have a lot of startups uh, innovating in this area already for healthcare financing more of insurance making insurance more cheaper for um, africans for supply chain and logistics you can sit there in the comfort of your room order your drugs and medication someone comes to deliver it to you that's just it straightforward for analytics i think most of the startups are using um, ai machine learning data and predictive, uh, predictive analytics to analyze all this numerous data that is coming from the healthcare system because you know our body already generates data right so all this data can give insight into what is happening within your system right so these startups you know leverage those data to make decisions for research and all uh what else laboratory testing the same thing order your test online pharmacy the same thing yeah diagnostic yeah yeah so other things that are not here maybe bioinformatics genomics where you can use you know comput um, computational um processes to analyze uh, genomes right to understand the person's genetic makeup and you know give personalized medicine um such person so i think that's i don't know if this covers all the this is not all the um, applications of tech in healthcare but i believe it covers majority then of course ai um artificial intelligence so now just putting everything together design thinking grassroots initiative tech how how did they all come together? So I'm going to give you a case study of where I work, Zuri Health. We have this medical camp we are doing in collaboration with MPESA Foundation in Kenya. And what we basically do is to take healthcare to the grassroots. So as I've said, you know, take healthcare to the grassroots. And how did we um, get to this point? So still design thinking, you know, talking to all these people. Okay, what do you guys need? So they told us they don't have money to go to the clinic. They don't have money for medication right they don't even know if they have this particular disease or not no screening no access to screening oh you do nobody's going to do free screening for you honestly so they, they don't know the kind of um, healthcare illness or health they might have right so those are the things those are the challenges we figured out during our design thinking process and we're like okay they don't have money so what do we do let's let's bring um the free medical camp to these communities right so design thinking helped us to come up with this medical camp to design the medical camp as a program to help solve this problem so we did it by partnering with mpesa foundation and um 
also collaborate with the com as i've said grass grassroots initiative you need to work with the community healthcare workers work with the um government or local government involved so we worked with those people and we're able to come up with this medical camp which we've done in over over five counties in kenya impacting 24,000 people right so what does the medical camp entails one we give them access to free screening they get free one year um, insurance membership right it's where they can access for their medical services so free screening medication we give them medication as well at that point and um then the tech the tech pack comes in after the camp so we get all their data on our system then we follow up do sms consultation whatsapp consultations for them so you can see how these three blended together right to come up with a very impactful um solution so these are the ways i think we can think around hacking healthcare in africa thank you so much i don't know if i'm right on time um thank you so much for listening i'll take questions now if you have any thank you so much um that was olutala vivian giving us a talk on healthcare hacking offering very practical approaches through design thinking approaches and oh thank you so much ma for your time um it feels like in this climate we are needing to be more innovative in terms of our approach of healthcare um there's this popular saying by plato that necessity is the mother of invention and so in this day and age i feel like there's a need to be more innovative and creative with solving our problems or finding new ways to solve old problems. So thank you so much once again, Olutola. Um, before we move forward, I would like to um, recognize the presence of one of our advisory board members, Professor Tonya Onyeka. Thank you so much, Ma, for being amongst us. Um, I don't know if you'd like to share a few words with us before we carry on with today's program. Okay, um, well, all right, we'll, okay. You can go okay. ahead, I think she's no longer. All right, no. all right, all right, thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll take questions now. Does anyone have any questions for um, Mulutala? Please indicate by the raise of hands. Um, Ibube, your hand is raised. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Good evening. Okay, good evening. Okay, from the from the talk, I found out that um that Kenya um in that Kenya, like there was provision of a free medical checkup and also insurance, one year insurance. So in Nigeria now, um from what I've seen, um insurance are always made available for civil servants those working in government hospitals and i feel i i feel most of the time the way people work the way people get services is very out of pocket um out of pocket payments so i want to know um are there grants that um people can apply for to make um health insurance available in nigeria especially when maybe we go for um health um what they call it um, outreaches, medical outreaches, are there grants that people could apply for? Uh, are there other are there things that you feel we could actually do to make um insurance readily available for um people in the hosp in the villages, people that are not civil servants? Because um I noticed that when I went for one health outreach outreach and I was advising them to go for screening and for a lot of things, for medical checkup, for screening, for um medical checkup in general. Like they were just telling me they don't have money, they don't have money, they don't have money. That was the issue. And um, we medical practitioners, we are practically starting. So I don't think we have up to one million naira in our pocket. So we'd actually need help from um, government, from different organizations. So do you know about different um, grants that one could actually um, apply for to make all these things readily available for people in Nigeria? Sorry. Yes, I heard you. 
So I, I don't think I'm aware of a grant that you can apply for. So for the one in Kenya, it was in collaboration with the government and with the Empesa Foundation, right? So I believe you still we probably need to work with the government. I think this NHIA in Nigeria is actually it cover. I don't think it's for government people. I think it's you get. Um, I don't. I'm not sure if it's only for government people. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure, but I guess um, but for the question, I don't have any idea of grants that you can use. But I think the startups that are actually into insurance are solving that. They're making it more cheaper. They're making it more, more cheaper for even, you know, people who are not too buoyant to assess. I know for Wella Health, I think as low as maybe 800 Naira thereabouts, right? For health insurance so you can just check more on those startups maybe those are the people you should partner with for your outreaches so they can sell their insurance you know at a cheaper that is more cheaper to these people they are reaching out to right so i think maybe partnering with those um those um insurance startups can solve your problem but for grants i don't think i i know i know about that Um, sorry, is it W E double L A? Yes, so you can check Wella Health, you can check Curacel, you can check Flurry. Um, yeah, so you can check. Let me go back to that slide. So you can check Wella Health, Flurry, Curacel, 10 MG. So those are the ones I know, and I'm sure of. They actually give cheap, you know, health assurance. All right, thank you. All right. Um, sorry, Cliff, can you write down the names of these um, um, organizations in the in check message box? Yeah. Sure. yeah sure. Thank you. All right, it will be. I hope that answered your question. Um, Andala, your hand is raised. Do you have a question? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, this is Ndala John from Nairobi. Um, uh, Vivian, thank you for your, the presentation. It was a wonderful one. I think I've gotten a few aspects that I, I think if implemented, we could be on our way to, to Sorry, I think I lost you, John. I don't know if I'm the only one. Hi, John, are you there? I please confirm if you can hear John. I can hear him at my end. All right. Um, sorry, we seem to have lost John. So we will be moving straight into the next session. Um, so. so now we'll be introducing our next speaker, Dr. Ahaneku Ekenedirichuko. He's a psychologist and public health physician. Ohaneku Ekene Dirichuku Blasingim is a psychologist, a Nigerian doctor with Imo State Primary Healthcare Development Agency, and the founder, executive director of BLAS Initiative for Health Education. BLAS Innovative Minds, a social enterprise building leaders and ambassadors of standard through education. This enterprise sees to the good health and well-being of teenagers and the provision of healthcare awareness to people in rural communities. Ekene is an active stakeholder at the Imo State Primary Healthcare Development Agency, playing pivotal roles during polio and men A immunization and the current COVID-19 va COVID vaccine introduction, and a medical officer of health at ME PHC Center over in North. He is an active member of the Imo State Public Health Emergency Operations Center under the Risk Communication and Surveillance Pillars. 
He plays lead roles in risk communication and community engagement by supervising community-based volunteers. Ekene is a member of Pan-African University's Debating Council. He served as its PRO in 2016. He is a fellow WHO Primary Healthcare Youth Leaders Network and a scholar of Yala Young Leaders Academy. He's a winner of several national and international awards and has represented his country in several international fronts. He volunteers with many organizations like Breast Cancer Association of Nigeria. He's involved in free medical care to rural communities with a passion for correcting the ills of the African health sector through advocacy and investigative writing as he paves his way in the world of primary health care, public health, and public policy. Please let's welcome Dr. Ekene Dirichuko. All right, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you. All right, thank you very much. I will have to share my screen. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Thank you very much for inviting me to speak on this very topic. If everyone can hear me, I can proceed from here. Hello? Yes, so we can hear you. You all did, we all did. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll be talking to us about a intergenerational dialogue, nurturing partnership between young and seasoned leaders. You know, we live in a society where ageism seems to be a problem, where um, the elderly ones in the healthcare system sometimes do not agree in most of the things, in most of the ideologies, in most of the innovations that comes from the younger ones. I was so happy hearing Olutola talk more about how we can actually make use of, you know, tech to better the healthcare sector. And most often, it is something that has to do with understanding between the various generations that makes up this very health sector for these things to work. So, for instance, if we have the younger ones not getting access to space for them to interact, you know, identify common interests and, you know, getting involved in representations and making sure that they are sorry, part wait, in planning and implementation your... of health policies. Sorry to cut you off in your speech, sir. Um, could you make the slide to be full screen? We can't quite see what you're presenting. Okay, from my end, it is. Can you see it right now? Um, not quite fully. Not quite fully. Okay. Um. So, it is to put it on presentation mode. Um, yeah, it uh, is. To click on the icon for. Okay. Um, it is on presentation already. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Can you be seen? Go to slide. Go to so. Uh, yes. It's on slide show already. I'm back to normal. No, this is slide show. Supposed to. Right. Sorry. Inside. The, the start from the beginning on it. 
everything is lost. Did um, I say? Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Okay, who your slide? So, so I will be able to Marchi, please, if you can hear what he said, can you please help me out? Um, I couldn't get what he said either. I think we could just carry on with the slide as is. Um, Okay, can you see the slide now? Yes. Go to writing. Uh, I think I'm not the only one having issues hearing what you are saying. I I can barely hear what you are saying. Talk. All right, most of the things I'm going to be discussing with us are things we can actually, you know, understand and um, relate with without even the slide. So let us not bother much about the slide. So in the course of this discussion, I'm going to be talking about why intergenerational dialogue is really key in the health sector to make sure that we nurture a partnership between young and seasoned leaders. Now we are going to look into its benefits and as well look at the positives and negatives in this to make sure that everyone benefits for the health sector to grow. Then we are going to look at the dynamics of this process. Then I'm going to give us a summary. Now to start again, why intergenerational dialogue is very important. Like I was saying before the whole glitch, in a community, it is very important that everyone of different ages are being involved in a particular project that is being done, especially in the space that we are talking about healthcare. So, for instance, it's very important that young healthcare workers, elderly healthcare workers, everyone who is involved in the healthcare space is being carried along in planning and implementation of healthcare projects. And it's as well very important that we understand that community resilience is very key in intergenerational dialogue. So while we do this at the level of the healthcare workers, it's still very important that we consider it at the level of communities that we serve. So people of different ages, their opinions matter a lot whenever we are taking decisions where whenever we are making decisions on how their health is going to be taken care of so these dialogues aim to you know create open communication among these various generations and um, people of diverse cultures you know thereby allowing increased communication across age boundaries people need to be carried along before they can actually you know be part of a process if they are going to contribute positively to such a process. So we have different inclusive formats that can be used for these dialogues. Some people make use of workshops, storytelling sections. It could be true, you know, providing training. It could be true, you know, support system, you know, setting clear objectives and creating um, ways of celebrating people for what they must have achieved. Be you an elderly person in a particular sector, be you an elderly person or a younger person, whenever there is a milestone achieved, everyone gets to ce celebrate you. These things are ways by which we can include everyone and make sure that we can achieve an aim or something that can help us promote the healthcare sector. Now, First off, we have how these things exist in our societies. But before we talk about how they can actually exist in our societies, I want us to understand that intergenerational dialogue is something that is key and very important. So its benefit cuts across wherever we work, be someone that works in the non-governmental organization, 
in the health ministry, in the hospital, or any healthcare facility at all, we see this as an opportunity for us to, you know, foster mutual understanding, respect, and um, make sure that everyone is being carried along in whatever thing they are doing. For instance, for people who are in the hospital, there has always been this problem among younger doctors and um, elderly nurses. I don't know, we are Nigerians. If you're a doctor and you, you, you're working in the hospital, you find that most often you see those elderly nurses, especially the female ones, feeling intimidated or they don't feel comfortable when they have younger doctors who do not respect them as who they are. So there are things we need to understand here. If we must actually give people, give patients the right services that they deserve, it is very important that we understand boundaries and make sure that when we come to our workplaces, we respect everyone equally. So to some of them, they feel like, okay, as a mother, it's very important that it's very important that you should respect me because I can give birth to you. Now, to some of the younger doctors, they feel like being the doctor, I should be the one in charge in everything that is happening here. But the very essence of our work is not about all this. Rather, we should create a platform where everyone gets to, you know, air their view, maybe through meetings, through um, um, focal group discussions, where these things can be channeled to the management and everybody gets to respect each other. We do our work and make sure that we serve the public the way we should. Now, another benefit to this is promoting social inclusion, making sure that um, we have good civic engagement and collective action. Just like I explained earlier, it's very important we understand that if we are serving the public, because if all we do in the healthcare sector is to make sure that people get well, is to make sure that um, we prevent diseases, and is to make sure that we enforce or make sure that there is proper health education to, to help people not to suffer from diseases. We need to understand that for such a collective action, it is not something that doctors who feel that they are the only ones that can help do this. It is not something that people who are um, health educators will feel like they are the only ones that can help do this. Rather, we need to make sure that everyone comes together, know their role, and plays it the right way they should. It's very important that we understand that promoting the intergenerational transmission of cultural heritage, identity, creating a more cohesive and harmonious community is something that is really key. And for us to benefit from this, we need to understand what is inherent in a particular culture, and we need to respect it whenever we are going there. For instance, you know, when we go for medical outreaches in some northern communities in Nigeria, you need to understand that there are some cultural norms that you need to respect. So for instance, if you are not allowed to wear your shoe, maybe when you enter a particular area, maybe some of their um, leaders, their houses, you need to do that. Some, they don't allow you as a lady to wear trousers. You need to respect that. So those are things we need to do to make sure that everyone gets to respect each other and the work is done accordingly. Now, why this is an issue is because sometimes we get to understand that some elderly ones who even do the same work with us, if you are younger in the profession and you don't do those things according to the culture, according to what they feel that should be done at that point, they don't feel like you should belong to where they, you should belong the same place with them. So that becomes a problem. So we need to understand that intergenerational dialogue is an avenue that we can actually reach out to one another, explain things, create better understanding so that when we go out there to do our work, it helps us, you know, discharge our duties the way it should be and everybody gets to benefit from this and everyone goes home happy. Now, in our workplaces, just like as I mentioned earlier, it's very important that we understand that 
when we engage in dialogues among different classes of people, among different you know, ages or generations in such a workplace, it helps us to you know, bring about powerful solutions for sustainable development. And it helps us to make sure that we can actually make use of the wisdom and experience of the elderly ones while we are still utilizing the innovative ideas of the young ones and their energy to ensure that we achieve what we want. Now, having said that, it's very important that we understand that there are a lot of things that are involved in making sure that this works. So for there to be a good dialogue among people of different generations, we need to encourage active listening. Active listening in the sense that no one tends to, you know, claim that whatever point another person is making when we are about to plan or when we are planning a project doesn't matter. If you are younger, don't say that the ideas that is being charted by the elderly ones are outdated. And if you are an elderly person, don't feel like the younger ones are, you know, saying nonsense. We need to respect everyone and listen to what they have to offer. Then while we are listening to what one another has to offer, we need to make sure we foster human connections. So in different workplaces, understand how each and every one of you that makes up that particular place you know, works and relates well with one another. Because it's very key for you to be able to work with one another when you get to understand how these people works and how they can be able to relate with one another. Now, it's as so well very important that we understand that when we listen actively, it helps us to create you know, an understanding of whatever opportunity that is going to be outlined by one another. So having said this, we need to understand that improved communication matters a lot. That means if we communicate well, we can actually pick points from one another we can actually make sure that we understand each other for us to serve people better. And the people I'm talking about in the course of this discussion has to do with our patients, our clients, to make sure that we set a standard of a better healthcare delivery system in Nigeria, because that is the ultimate goal of what we are doing, or in Africa at large. Now, there are things that are required apart from this improved communication that I've talked about earlier. We need to understand that we cannot get to where we want to be in a day. Now, it's just like every now and then, people keep clamoring about racism in some places of the world or almost everywhere in the world. If racism is a problem and people keep talking about racism, and it doesn't, it doesn't just wipe off racism at once. That means it's something that takes time for people to understand what they should do. That means being resilient and making sure that young and seasoned leaders work together is something that is very key. So it is a very basic um, requirement in making sure that we create a better partnership between the young and seasoned leaders. Now, just like what the last a presenter said, innovation is very important. We need to make sure that we come up with new ideas. I was so happy to hear her talk about some countries that are able, like in Africa, some countries that are able to have, you know, an EMR that can actually serve the whole nation. So I, I, I as a doctor, I wouldn't be having issues if I'm moving from one facility to another to keep getting data of my patients if I must have to move from one facility to another with such a patient. So if I can just get a code or maybe an identification number which can be used to key into a central database, I'll get all the information I need and make sure that I serve my patients well. So these things, we can just get them when people are innovative, when people try to think outside the box and make sure that things work better. And now we can, act, we can only respect the innovation of one another when we apply all those you know, different ways of coming together, all those different inclusive 
uh, formats, like I mentioned earlier, for us to understand one another, be it workshop, just like the setting that we have right now, it is an opportunity for us to actually discuss, get to understand one another and make sure that we can share our innovative ideas. While we are sharing our innovative ideas, it's very key for us to understand that this brings about growth. So if the healthcare system needs to get better by we encouraging intergenerational dialogue, dialogue amongst people of different generations, that means we need to do it in a way that it brings about development, it brings about growth. Now, another important thing we need to understand, and which is an area we need to channel our energy in this discussion, Having talked about the inclusive formats or inclusive frameworks that can be applied, we need to understand that most times mentorship programs and reverse mentorship programs are always the ultimate way of getting people of different ages or different generations together. So, for instance, in a mentorship program in a particular sector, it works in a way that the mentor benefits from the mentee, Why the mentee as well benefits from the mentor. It is more of more or less a mutual thing. So it is not parasitic. So when it is mutual, we get to understand that it allows the mentee an opportunity to share relevant ideas on how to better the system to the mentor. Why the mentor uses that opportunity to share experiences and knowledge to the, to the mentee. So when it happens that way, you find that, that it gives, it provides an opportunity for people to bond. It provides opportunity for people of different ages to bond and help in the service that they render in the society, like here in the field of healthcare. Now, when we are talking about reverse mentorship, so we find that, that sometimes there are opportunities where people of the younger generation take, for instance, take as an example, most of the people who are of the older generation are not really grounded with how to use tech. I could remember working in the hospital where my consultants will always want me to type for them. They don't really, they are not fast with documentation with the EMR. So they feel like you that is younger need to do this for them. And they keep asking you questions, how did you do this one? How did you do the other one? Because they want to learn. So in such a situation, you find out that someone who is supposed to be your mentor is learning for it from you, who is even supposed to be a mentee. So in that, particular incident or in that particular um, setting is more like a reverse mentorship thing. And no matter how it is coming, we need to understand that the major essence of this is for people to learn, understand one another, for us to ensure that there is a better partnership for the service that we have to deliver. So if the service delivery is not optimal, that means we are not doing this well. And for us to do it well, we must have to understand one another for us to move on. Other ways which we can apply is to you know, encourage startups where we have people of different age group participating to make sure that it works. Now, I have this example that we, some of us that must have seen the movie Young Sheldon, we see the, 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 the relationship between a young, uh, the young Sheldon and, his mentors like Dr. Uh, Dr. Stugard or so, I, I can't remember some of their names again. Now, most of these guys, they see this young chap as someone who is a genius. He knows a lot of things, but they still believe that there are things they need to learn from him. Why him too need to learn some certain things from him? So when he comes up with novel ideas that can help them win Nobel prizes, even at first, when they feel like they shouldn't jump into such ideas, when this guy tried carrying out things that will help him, you know, work in that line, some of them all of a sudden comes back to make sure that they are part of this project and they always keep supporting him. So you find that why this works is because these elderly professors come with their wealth of experience, knowledge to the system. Why this guy? is coming with his innovative ideas, they bring everything together to make sure that it works. The same thing is expected in the healthcare sector for us to move along, for us to make sure that we serve people the right way, because we need to understand that our priority is to make sure that our patients get better. Our priority is to make sure 
that people get better in the society, be it at the community level, be it at the tertiary facility level. These are the things we need to do. So our differences shouldn't be a problem. It shouldn't be a barrier to what we should achieve. Now, going further, we find that we have a role that our, our EQ plays for us to make sure that there is an effective leadership in this setting. So leadership development programs are very key for us to make sure that there is good partnership between young and seasoned leaders. So how does this work? We ensure that people who are young and people who are older come together during leadership programs in the healthcare system or in the healthcare sector, just like um, Nigeria Health Watch organizes such programs where you find that, that where, where you find younger generation of healthcare workers and the older generation come together to rub minds to see how we can make sure that things get better. And this is something that every one of us, we need to think outside the box to make sure that we come up with better solutions to problems where we can ensure that people of different ages come together to make sure that things work. Now, for people, I know there are some of us that can be asking questions in terms of how to make things work. How can we come up about these mentors that can help us as young leaders in the healthcare profession. Myself, I have this problem. You know, health profession or medical profession seems to be an area where for you to get a mentor who is going to direct you on what you want to do is very difficult. Rather, what we find most often are people who want to coerce us to do what they must have done. So what am I trying to explain? You find that we have people who you see to be your mentor, you, you get closer to them, you try to explain to them the difficulties you are having, you try to explain to them, okay, the, the challenges you are having navigating through different areas of the system. Now, most often, some of them give this advice or this guide of how you can actually come to the field or maybe the area of their own specialty to come and join them in that area. Most times we don't get the best mentorship advice that we need from most of these people we call our mentors in the health system. And that makes it a bigger problem. It forms a bigger challenge. That is the reason why we always keep having um, this whole rift between doctors and nurses, between some other healthcare workers versus another. So why that exists is because always some group are feeling superior to others. Some group are always trying to show that they are better than the others. And most of these things are based on ideologies that are being passed from one generation to another, and they keep upholding those things. Now, those things doesn't solve our problems. Rather, they cause more problems in the healthcare sector. So how can we you know, get ourselves rid of all these things? Now we need to seek compatibility. For younger people, we need to understand when we are getting the right mentorship and when we are getting the wrong things. No one should come and tell me that I should not relate well with the nurses that I work with in the same facility with, because it doesn't make sense. At the end of the day, we all should work as a team to ensure that patient care is, is, is achieved. But when we neglect all those things, at the end of the day, our patients are not going to get better. That becomes a bigger challenge to us. And that is why you see the whole rift that exists, like I mentioned earlier, the, the rift between elderly female nurses and younger male doctors, or uh, most times even younger female doctors. You know, they feel like you, are, you, are, you, are, you should be the age of my daughter. You should not talk to me the way you are talking to me. And this person is feeling like, okay, I should be the head of this thing. So whatever thing I tell you, you should do it that way. And most times it falls back to, the orientation we must have been given, some of the things that we must have been told by people who are mentoring us. So we need to see compatibility. If we want to grow, if we want to get the system better, we need to be compatible with people who want to get the system better. We need to get rid of those people who gives us advices that won't get the system better. Now, we need to build relationships. So our relationships should not be limited to people who are in that same field with us. So for instance, if I'm a nurse, my relationship should not be among my nurse colleagues or nursing colleagues. Now, I should be a good relationship with, you know, um, radiographers, medical lab scientists, 
pharmacies, doctors, everyone, to make sure that we'll be able to achieve our goal, the common goal of taking care of the patient. Now, regular communication is very important and very key. This is a practical example of what, uh, what happens in our healthcare system or hospitals, where you see nurses write a lot of things. You see a doctor, for instance, taking care of a particular patient, a nurse is calling you in another word. Maybe you have two or three words that you have to cover because of the whole brain drain thing, and you have a lot of patients you are taking care of. Now, there is this lack of understanding, maybe due to poor communication, you see the nurse writing a whole lot of things. In fact, to the extent in my facility, in, in my former facility, they would say escalate to coverage because you didn't come immediately to come and see a particular patient. They failed to even get to understand what is holding this doctor or this other colleague back. Possibly you are taking care of another patient in another world, but they are writing a whole lot of things about you in another world. So those things doesn't solve the problem. So how, how about we getting to communicate with each other better, getting to understand each other better and know how we can, you know, cover up for each other because if we have limited number of nurses in the system, we have limited number of doctors in the system. So if we are just two or three working, we should understand that it is just us. And we need to know how to help one another to make sure that everything works fine. And that takes us to positive support. So we need to positively support one another. And the only way we can positively support one another is when we can actively listen to one another, understand where the problem is coming from. And that is the only way we can Proper solutions to these things. Now, going further, we have ways or processes of nurturing these intergenerational dialogues to make sure that it becomes productive. And now, this can work in two ways. Now, you know, when we talk about dialogues, we are talking about discourse, we are talking about, you know, interaction, we are talking about ways of communicating to make sure that things get better or to get worse. Now, that is the reason why. My slide here shows you the negative side of it and the positive side of it. So it's very important that we understand that if we want to make out something positive in the process of you know, interaction, in the process of you know, having an intergenerational dialogue among both the elderly people and the younger ones, we need to identify issues that we want to address at every point in time. We need not to you know, mobile over things. We need not to bring mix up things. It's very important we, we identify a problem at the, at the time and try to get it solved. So this is one thing I love that NCDC, National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, and um, some other stakeholders are doing. When we have outbreaks, maybe through the Public Health Emergency Operations Center and um, some other um, you know, opportunities where they set up you know, technical working group, which doesn't just constitutes only the elderly ones. They try to bring in the younger generation as well. Now, going globally, we understand that organizations like World Health Organization, um, UNICEF, and all those organizations, whenever we have UN-related programs, they try to make sure that they bring the younger generation into the discourse to make sure that why the elderly people are talking from their own viewpoint. Now, there is a different point of view that the younger ones are going to see this and they want to get everything fuse them together to make sure that we achieve something that is going to help us solve the problems that we have so identifying problems that we want to address and bringing people together to help make sure that these problems are being solved is very key and important so these people we bring together must be really uh, relevant stakeholders in the community with the capacity to discuss and address these issues so that is why we have um um, um world health organization during um, and united nations during world health assembly inviting young people from um international federation of medical students association um some other younger um associations of other you know health related um outfits so at the end of the day it's not like they are just giving these people opportunity for fully funded uh, um, platforms for them to just travel and come back they give them opportunity to dialogue to prepare for things that that is going to happen in the nearest future i remember being part of some of these events in a couple of times 
we always have our youth-led delegations and we as well have our deliberations now before we come together with everyone so when we are coming together it gives the younger ones you know the opportunity to have a viewpoint and also a standpoint as well what they should contribute what the elderly ones should contribute at the end of the day everything works together for good to make sure that we serve the people who we are supposed to serve the right way now that's primary dialogue or discussion that happens at various groups, the elderly, the young, and everyone is the preparation that should happen before the general dialogue. So that is why we have to prepare for dialogue events. So before we go for most of these things, people of different groups, people of um, different ethnicities, cultures, what have you, need to discuss all these things so that when we come together, we are coming up with solutions. It's just like we are discussing, you know, intergenerational discourse today, how we can nurture partnership between young and seasoned leaders. Now, our, our problem today is not just the negative or is not about the negative side of it. You know, all those ageism that exist in the workplace or workspace, hate and conflict that already exist in our discussions, and um, whatever thing that must have been causing them, just as I categorize them as the negative side of it, you know, people tend to say, okay, when there is economic dislocation, when there is collision of interest or ideals, policies can come into play, and some other ideological awakening that can actually bring about, you know, hate speeches, conflict, even ageism, like as I mentioned, all these things are problems. But rather, what we should focus our minds today is how can we make intergenerational dialogues work to the betterment of the health sector? So because of this, this is why I take up these dynamics. And I'm very happy that one of the things I listed here has already been discussed by the first you know, speaker when she was talking about innovative thinking. It's very important that we understand that this is how these, uh, these things work not just in the health sector, but rather if we want to make sure that things get better in every sector, these things are very key and they will help us. Now, effective communication strategies is really key, just like as I've been discussing how communications can go haywire in our workplaces based on the fact that people tend not to understand each other. But when we build strategies that, that, that can help people understand each other, it helps us, you know, actualize our aim whenever we have intergenerational discourse or dialogue now mutual learning opportunities is very key so people need to understand that learning opportunity should be embraced with a, a positive mindset we should have positive attitude towards embracing opportunities learning opportunities so that someone who is making a presentation is way younger than you are doesn't necessarily mean that you are not going to you know pick something good something new from that discussion and that is why we keep saying you know we learn we unlearn and we relearn so for you to unlearn what you must have learned to relearn means that you have to come with an open mind even if you seem to be 20 30 40 years older than the person who is presenting or somebody who is you know actually piloting the discussion but what matters most is how that discussion is going to help actualize or maybe achieve the aim which has to do with how we can better the society in terms of healthcare provision now we need to ensure that we overcome generational divides like as i mentioned you know generational divides like ageism where you see the um the the other people trying to talk down on younger people even when they have good initiatives because of their age such a thing is really wrong i think it's very important that we understand that people need to be respected for the ideologies that they come with for the impact that they are about to make or that they make and not just about the number which is age now i wouldn't want to talk much about innovative thinking because i think enough said on that already because of time now promoting creativity is very key just like innovation we need to ensure that we try out new ways of doing things and with that I, I think i am going to be encouraging us while we discuss while we talk about intergenerational dialogue it's very important that we try out new ways of doing things i remember when i was in medical school i was the first person to start an e-survey in my school during our 
uh, community health or community medicine uh, uh, um, research work, I had to, you know, convince the HOD, I had to convince my supervisor, I convinced a lot of lecturers, see the reason why I want to do this. I worked on COVID related um, topics and I needed to, you know, my research was more on healthcare workers. And I need not to be meeting most of these healthcare workers one on one. So most often, because of COVID nineteen, I needed to like send my questionnaire through maybe some of them in the department, go to maybe a particular facility in a particular department, get their WhatsApp lines, reach out to them personally, and tell them I want to send this survey to them so that they can help me complete them. So at the end of the day, my supervisor agreed. My supervisor was able to you know convince the other members of the panel and i was able to do that now that was creative in and of itself and it helps other people after my year other people started doing the same thing now we need to understand that we need to be creative we need to think outside the box even when we are providing care for our patients so a particular thing is not available in a, in the hospital you feel like this is the work of a particular person or group of persons so if these people don't do it, we are not supposed to do it. Take, for instance, there are some facilities where they say um, nurses don't give IV drug. And uh, you, you find that, that few doctors who are on call or who are on duty, they are occupied, they are very busy attending to emergencies. You, as a nurse, you can give that IV drug. We are not saying always give the IV drug for the doctors, but if it calls that this must be done, why not? try to be creative, help out, and make sure that things work out. And there are better, there, there are other inspiring, innovative ways we can do these things. This is just as basic as it sounds, but it really matters for us to move the healthcare forward. Now, some other thing that is very important, why we are looking at these dynamics to make sure that things work, we need to understand that we need to learn how to overcome barriers and challenges of intergenerational di uh, dialogue because those things matters a lot. Now, intergenerational dialogue is not without its challenges and its own barriers. We need to understand this from the whole discussion we've been having. So such things like you know, resistance, reluctance um, from both the younger people and the older people to engage with one another. You know, Someone will come up and say, oh, I taught this boy. How am I even going to engage with him? So that brings about reluctance. You know, sometimes the younger person wants to meet with an elderly one and share an innovative idea with them to make sure that we better the system, they resist it. So all these things are barriers. So, you know, issues like power imbalance or conflict between different age groups can as well cause problems. So we need to understand that those things are problems, even more like other ones, like communication difficulties, like we mentioned earlier, and then some other you know, practical constraints or limitations. But now to overcome these things, all these dynamics are very important. But then we need to understand that we, we, we should create a balance in the representation of different people whenever we are going to have a discourse. Take for instance, the same way in most of our um, non-governmental organizations and um, partners, or stakeholders in the healthcare sector prioritize um, community engagement and accountability to make sure that there is an inclusive framework for everyone. You see them talking about, you know, um, people who are uh, people with um, disability and um, talking about people who are vulnerable in one way or the other, being included in any project they are carrying out those things are very important as well when we want to make sure that people are being represented already inferiority complex sets in when some group of people in the healthcare space feels that they are inferior to others so but when such exists and during meetings during discussions like this everyone is carried along and not just carrying people along because this person has spent 20 years as a cleaner in the hospital now there is a younger cleaner who works in that hospital so while we are having you know, management meeting, we bring both the younger ones, the, the elderly ones, people of different age groups being represented in that group, people of different de departments and age groups being represented. You find that it solves this problem of power imbalance, it solves the problem of, you know, conflict between different age groups. Because if you have a younger doctor who is there, is 
easier for that younger doctor to re relate well with a younger nurse, a younger cleaner who is in that meeting than people who, are, who belongs to another age group. So when everyone sees that their age group is being represented, it builds that confidence, it builds that you know, trust again, which helps in making sure that the whole intergenerational dialogues works. Now, just like as I mentioned trust, it's very important that we know, if we understand that to overcome this, we as well need to build rapport and trust with the participants, which are our, our, our end beneficiaries of the services we render, our patients, our clients. So we need to make sure that we create better rapport. The rapport should not be just for doctors and nurses. If a patient is sent to the lab for lab investigations, how do you as a lab scientist relate with this patient? As a cleaner who is coming to clean the ward, who is coming to clean this patient's room, how do you rapport with this patient? All these things help us out to make sure that we have, we nurture a better, on, a better partnership between the younger ones and the elderly ones, and it helps us discharge our duties better. Now, another important tool we need to use is, um, clear and inclusive language. Just like as I said, during this course, people need to be included. And when we are still making presentations, people need to feel among, people need to feel included in whatever thing that is being discussed because it's very key. Now, I would like us to look at something else which is very important, which this dynamics talks about. Now, we need to plan ahead and be flexible in whatever thing we are doing. So why effective communication strategies is very key why innovative thinking is very important promoting creativity is very key we need to understand that always we need to work ahead of time to make sure that we create things that will help us work better so coming from the younger ones your energy is needed your innovative ideas are needed coming from the elderly ones it's quite understandable that they come with you know, a wealth of understanding knowledge that is needed by the younger ones, and everybody contributes equally. Now, in summary, we need to get some certain things clear. Nurturing partnership between young and seasoned leaders involves, you know, fostering collaborations, like as I mentioned earlier, talking about mentorship, shared discussion making, decision making, sorry, all these things are very key because when we talk about fostering collaboration, you need to ensure that people work together. People get to understand one another, just like the, the picture I have here. If I do not understand the idea behind what a particular group is doing, even if it is a youth, even if it is a, a, it, is a it is a youth based organization and I'm a young person, I may not be able to key into whatever thing they are doing. And come to think of it. It becomes difficult for someone who do not belong to that age group to key into that. And at the end of it, you find that whatever solution that group is trying to profile in the health sector is not going to fly. But when we understand each other, it ensures that collaboration works and we are able to get our end goal, which is making sure that we serve these people our patients, our clients, the right way they should. Now, shared decision making is very important. We shouldn't say the elderly ones because they have this wealth of knowledge, understanding of things because they have always been there as old as Methuselah. They should be the ones making the decision. No, the younger ones still have a role to play. They have some contributions to make. So everyone should be carried along. Now, by creating safe space for dialogue, it enables everyone to feel among, it enables everyone to feel included, it enables everyone to see it as their own project. So that will help us you know, provide practical resources like tools, which is going to be coming from both the younger ones and the elderly ones. So this is you talking about both the younger ones and the seasoned leaders. Everyone helps to make sure that we solve problems in the healthcare sector. Now, Offering specialized training is very key. So for instance, we have the elderly ones who have undergone some level of training. So we should not allow our experience, we should not allow our knowledge die with us. This is another important thing we need to note. So training
for intergenerational dialogue to work, that means we need an amplified voice of the older generation, the seasoned leaders, and the younger ones to make sure that we serve the public well. We need to make sure that we, we have innovative driven ideologies and we promote them equally. So devoid of who it is coming from, it's something that we should encourage. And we need to make sure that Generation Next is empowered. So everyone feels among, everyone feels tolerated, everyone feels carried along to make sure that we share ideas, we share opportunities, we contribute our own quota to make sure that things get better. So why having gone through all these things, we need to understand that intergenerational discourse is really a big challenge owing to the fact that partnership between younger ones and their seasoned leaders seems to be very difficult. But when we try our best to apply these solutions that has been outlined this evening, it's really going to help us work better. Don't be uptight as a younger leader, feeling like um, you have all it takes because you are vibrant, you are energetic, you are the you are you are the you are the you are the you are the work power or you are the workforce of your organization. Still understand that there is something, there are things that the elderly ones need to contribute. And when you understand this and accept them for whom they are, make sure that everyone contributes equally, everyone's voices are being heard. It will help us go a long way to ensure the changes that we need to ensure that there is better participation and community engagement amongst every one of us in the healthcare sector. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Ekene, for that. Um, piece of conversation on internet on internet generational dialogues communication fostering community through open dialogue among medical and health personnel in order to bridge generational divides um that was truly impactful i'm sure we've all learned a lot from that and we will now take any questions does anyone have any questions Okay, Moses, I see your hand up. Go ahead. All right. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ekenedi. Oh, wow. I so much appreciate your time and your detailed analysis. Thank you very much sir, for the lecture. And um, my question goes like this. Um, along the line, you talked something about um, being innovative and creative in thinking when it comes to uh, activities being carried out in the hospital using your innovative mindset. So I have a, a scenario that I want to ask a question about. There was a time I worked as a lab scientist in the government hospital and uh, the nurses and doctors has left. So it's only the midwife that was still around looking up after the patient. And uh, that night, there was a need to attend to that patient. Automatically, the patient was unconscious. So he, there was a need that the midwife was finding it difficult to get the nerve the veins, everything was very difficult for her. So I needed to help at that particular time. So the next day, I was expecting a thank you and congratulations from those nurses and uh, doctors. But I ended up having a clear analysis of the ethics, the norms of the particular institution, the particular hospital in particular community in the sense that if you are not within this curriculum of health professionals you are not meant to carry out such activity. 
So my question is, how do we intend to curb? How do we intend to direct? How do we intend to uh, figure, or should I say, position our innovative thinking when it comes to such activities? All right, thank you very much. I, I I saw that question coming anyways, because people always try to, you know, work their back to make sure that they don't do things that is really going to hurt them, maybe take away their license or stop them from practicing for a while. Now, the questions I need to ask based on this is, first, if what you did wasn't done, is this patient likely going to die that night? Yes. Now, if this patient doesn't get this care, are we allowing this patient to go out there to people who are not professionals, handle whatever case that they came with? Yes. So at the end of the day, the only alternative that this person has is that the person, this person can go out there and die, or rather remain in the, in the facility and still die if this person goes unattended to. Now, it is more like a dilemma, but now we should understand that there are ways we help and we don't just blow our alarm and you shouldn't even make it open that you are helping the ethics are very important and there are and there are and there are you know stipulations that you should not go beyond so first off before you started this you said there is nobody in the cadre of those who are supposed to carry out this procedure there and that is the reason why you are doing it. So, situation, we all we need to be pragmatic here. We work in settings <laughs> where we found ourselves doing all those things. But it's not something we need to escalate. In fact, if it comes to documentation, it's not something we need to just run and document. There is someone who should be on duty in that particular world or in that particular place at that time. Nothing stops you from reaching out to that person maybe the next morning, see what happened. That person is going to thank you if it is done that way. But when it is being escalated, that person will try to, you know, save him or herself from queries. And you yourself, you are going to be queried too because you did what you're not supposed to do. So what that means is that whenever we are helping, we need to be careful with the help that we are rendering. And we should be careful as well what we want to get. I remember working in the dialysis suits where as a medical student i was never allowed to you know cannulate a patient before dialysis but i had some nurses who were working with me there they have been there for 20 30 years and they are professionals in doing this and i had patients i needed to cannulate i was still struggling with one this was my first time i was struggling with one and i had no senior who helped me now there are better ways of doing this some of them, there is one, I don't forget that woman. She came around, I was like, doctor, see what you're going to do. If you go this way, you'll be able to, you know, cannulate fine and it's going to be faster. If you do it this way, she just took the needle and was able to do the first one and it worked. I learned from her. So I need not to escalate that she did that because it is not a procedure that should be done by a nurse. But I learned from that nurse. So that's something we need to understand. But if I was acting, I'm the doctor in charge, this should not be done. My patient may die because I'm claiming to be the person who is supposed to do this. So sometimes we find ways of trying to balance some of these things. Yes, it's very difficult in the sense that you may not get your flowers as deserving, but the aim is to make sure that we take care of our patient, just like as I said before, that we are create, we are having intergenerational dialogue to ensure that there is better partnership between the younger and you know seasoned leaders. We are not doing it just for ourselves or for it to benefit us, but we are doing it to ensure that the outcome, the end goal, which is taking care of the patient, taking care of our clients, is being achieved. So how can we achieve this? However, we try to go around this, the the safety of our patients is the paramount thing so save the life of a patient forget about getting your flowers or not that's what i have to say about that thank you dr Kenny. um moses i hope that answers your question um do we have any other question
Okay, Moses, your hand is still raised. Yes, um, I still want to thank you very much for, for that continuous Okay, um, what I'm trying to understand is for you know for two years um states and Every position, any position or professional body in the head. Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? We can we can hear you. Yes, I can. I can. can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Loud and okay. clear. Your people. Uh, my question is, is there a system or a body or let me say a platform that can be raised even if it's true awareness fine so that every professional body can be able to understand the hierarchy or the position of every individual and still observe it respectfully, not with coercion or agreeing or competition because i'm saying this out of experience you see yourself where even though you are meant to do this another person out of how the profession is being rated like you guys that we call the medical docs you will use that profession to coerce somebody to do even what is meant for him or her to do instead of using amiable words amicable statements it tend to go towards co coercion is it a system or any platform that can be built around every health system in order to cope this particular uh should i call it activity that is running with some health sectors okay um i don't really know about a particular organization that is doing that currently but the only advice i can give is that the change starts with you and me there is something I do in every facility I've worked. When I see younger nurses or people I work with from the other areas of healthcare act in a particular way, I try to go closer to them. I make them understand that, okay, forget about people who are our chiefs. We seem to be at the same level and we need to understand each other. So you find that when you must have had discussion with these people, Within 5, 10, 15 minutes, a lot of things will start coming up. They start telling you how their chief is telling them to do this. Most of those younger nurses, they'll tell you, my chief said, whenever any doctor comes to the ward, don't go and touch that line. Even if the, 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 the drip is not going, even if the infusion is not running fine, don't touch it. Now, is that what a chief should tell the younger one? So we now, what you, is expected of you is to, you know, that reorientation, the whole reengineering process starts with us. We need to start making every one of us understand that the aim is not creating dichotomy, but the aim is for us to work in a harmonious atmosphere for the betterment of our patients. So if you start doing it, if I should start doing it, we get to understand each other better. The system, the, the, the system or the sector is going to become a better one. But if I go on, you know, planting seeds of this cord and you are doing the same from your own end, things will never get better. So I feel like it's more of an individual thing. We need to be those change agents that should key this and make sure that we keep propagating it. And some of us who know someone can start up an organization or if it exists, like I said, I don't know. And, you know, call people together, people of different, you know, um, will I say discipline and ensure that we continue to, you know, preach and propagate this ideology of coexistence, um, love and harmonious atmosphere in our work environment. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Kenneth. Um, today has been truly really impactful. 
from the conversation with Dr. Um, Ruth Ola Vivian and Dr. Ine. Ine, thank you so much. Now we've come to the end of day one of the fifth annual Johan Summit. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Dr. Nam Diopasi, as well as our speakers. Tomorrow promises to be equally impactful. We will be having a talk with um, Gabriel Okeke, Elvis C. Ume, Dr. Mzube Ogamba, and Dr. Mithoma Ibokwe. Um, so please do join us tomorrow, same time. Also, please do be in attendance as attendance will be taken at the end of tomorrow's session. Um, thank you guys. Thank you all so much for attending today. Uh, we will meet tomorrow as well. All right. Good night. Hello, Amarachi. Um, yes. Uh, so sorry. Um, thank you very much for the facilitating process. Please, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. How do we go about the registration? Is there a link, or how do we go about it? The attendance. Okay, the information will be packed across on the um, platform on the group chat after this. So we'll let you know. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. You're welcome.